October 11, 1892, the Toronto Daily Mail, Toronto, Canada. The Borden Murder, fresh evidence in possession of the state, of a very sensational character. Parties who heard groans and saw Lizzie Borden at a window, her alleged quarrel with her stepfather, a servant's testimony, counsel for the defense contradict the entire story. Boston, October 10. The Globe publishes a 13-column story from Fall River, setting forth in detail new and startling evidence for the prosecution in the Borden murder case, which, it says, is in the hands of the police and is to be given by 25 new witnesses who will testify for the state at the coming trial. The evidence is forthcoming from people who stand high in the communities where they live. Briefly stated, the new evidence is as follows. John H. Murphy, who resides on Bedford Street, Fall River, will testify that he was standing on the sidewalk close to the Borden house when Mr. Borden entered his yard about 1.40 o'clock in the morning of August 4, and he saw him a minute later ushered into the lobby by Bridget Sullivan that while Mr. Borden was walking in the yard, he saw a window blind of the room in which Mrs. Borden's body was afterwards found, cautiously opened by a young woman who had that same morning told him, when he called at the Borden house about 9.30 o'clock, that her father had gone downtown and would not be back until noon or later. This woman he has identified as Lizzie A. Borden. The window Mr. Murphy designates as the one in which he saw Lizzie is so situated that she must have been standing over the mutilated remains of her mother at the very time that her father was about to enter the house. The next witness of importance is Mrs. Gustav F. Ronald of Pawtucket, Rhode Island. About 9.40 on the morning of the murders, she was wheeling her baby carriage near the Borden house when she heard a terrible cry or groan. She looked up at the Borden house and saw in a room through a partially opened window, a woman whose head was in part covered by a rubber cape or hood, whose face she saw plainly as the distance was short. This window is the same as the one pointed out by Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Ronald was almost that minute approached by Peter Mahoney. He likewise had heard the groan and seen the woman at the window who wore the peculiar head covering and recognized her as the younger daughter of the Borden family all the members of which he knew well by sight. Augustus Gunning, at the time a lodger in Mrs. Churchill's house, is said to have seen Lizzie Borden in the window at the same time and under the circumstances. These witnesses, the Globe says, fix Miss Borden at her mother's side almost the minute when she probably was killed and when Lizzie, according to her own statement, was elsewhere. Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Chase of Fall River and Miss Abigail, their daughter, were friends of the elder Bordens and visited them on the evening previous to the murder. They overheard, it is stated, a quarrel between Lizzie and her father. They all heard Mr. Borden say, You can make your own choice and do it tonight. Either let us know what his name is or take the door on Saturday and when you go fishing, Fish for some other place to live, as I will never listen to you again. I will know the name of the man who got you into trouble. Lizzie is said to have replied, If I marry this man, will you be satisfied that everything will be kept from the outside world? Then the visitors were announced and conversed with Mr. and Mrs. Borden on the subject of the quarrel. Mr. Borden said, I would rather see her dead than have it come out. G. Romaine Pitson, a wealthy New York dealer in machinery supplies, has made affidavit that a few days prior to the murder, Mr. Borden consulted him as a friend about Lizzie, whose trouble he related in detail. Mr. George J. Sesson of Fall River is said to have heard Lizzie say to Bridget Sullivan, the hired girl, why don't you say how much money you want to keep quiet? Bridget's answer was, I don't know what you mean but you're not the girl I took you to be. George Sesson, it is said, will swear that less than a month before the murder, 
Mr. Borden told him he had made a will giving Emma and Lizzie $25,000 cash, which was more than he would have allowed them, but for his wife's intercession. Bridget Sullivan will, it is claimed, corroborate the story of the quarrel between Mr. Borden and Lizzie. Also, that she heard the night before the murders, Morse and Lizzie talking about a will. Also, that on the afternoon of the murder, Lizzie whispered to her, keep your tongue still and don't talk to those officers, and you can have all the money you want. Detective McHenry and his wife Will, it is said, give important evidence which relates in part to the story of the row between Lizzie and Emma Borden in the matron's room, in which the former accused the latter of having given her away. This tale, it is said, will be corroborated by the McHenrys, who overheard and saw the affair through a hole in the wall, especially prepared by the authorities. It is claimed that, in this quarrel, Lizzie kicked Emma several times in the leg. Fatal Contradiction Fall River, Mass., October 10 Andrew J. Jennings, counsel for the defendant in the Borden murder cases, made the following statement to an Associated Press correspondent today. The matter published in a Boston paper this morning relating to the murders of Andrew J. Borden and his wife is a tissue of lies. I have endeavored to find out about Mr. and Mrs. Fred Chase at the number indicated, 198 4th Street, Fall River. There is not only no such number, but not any within 50 of it. There is no such name as George F. Sisson in the directory, nor can I find any person who knows anybody of that name. The kernel of the whole malicious story deals with a condition which is absolutely disproved by things found in the cellar by the prosecution and admitted to be what Miss Lizzie claimed they were. Subsequent events have confirmed her claim. Mr. Morse says that the whole story is absolutely false, not a word of truth in it. The Reagan story has already been denied by Miss Emma and Miss Lizzie and was admitted by Mrs. Reagan to be false to at least six persons. A member of the police force says that the names used in the story indicated are fictitious, but the matter is substantially true. June 21, 1893, Meriden Daily Republican, Meriden, Connecticut. Lizzie Borden at home. She spent a very pleasant night. Fall River, Massachusetts, June 21. Lizzie A. Borden returned with her sister this morning to her house on 2nd Street after having spent the night at Charles J. Holmes' residence on Pine Street. They drove up to the gate in a closed carriage, and their entrance was most painful to witness. There were very few spectators, for the crowds of last night knew nothing of the hour when the long-imprisoned girl would return. They denied themselves to all newspaper men. The sofa on which her father lay when he was murdered is again at the central police station and will not be removed for a day or two. Miss Lizzie spent a very pleasant night and was very cheerful at breakfast in the Holmes residence this morning. A domestic in the family house on 2nd Street is reported to have said that the two girls broke down completely when they had entered their old home. Today, Andrew J. Jennings is receiving letters and telegrams of congratulations from all parts of the country, and Miss Borden's mail at the post office is very heavy. The temper of the people of the city has been changed greatly by the verdict, and there is a manifest respect for the decision of the jury. The Borden verdict of not guilty was received in various ways in this city, and many strong protesters of her innocence prior to the verdict seemed to have veered around and were equally as set as to her guilt. Perhaps of all those that have stoutly maintained that Lizzie was guilty, the women of Meriden have been the most consistent as well as conspicuous.